hospital. I don't the have to do anything. I've been in you. captivity for three months. There are two things I want to do. I want an American cheeseburger. Endgame happened. A beautiful, cathartic film that not only paid tribute to the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also summarized it in a way, which is pretty badass. Fortnite and dabbing was also thrown in there, which is pretty great. As an epic gamer, I appreciate that. I don't think there's ever been such a film ever made. I most definitely think this is one of the greatest cinematic events in history, and I definitely don't think it's perfect. Wow, what a... What a what a subversion, huh? Yeah, you see, I love Endgame. I do. I love it. But I don't love love it as much as I'd like. I hope that makes sense. I think a few things drag it down. We're going to talk about the amazing and not so amazing of Endgame today, and I hope you all enjoy the trip. So, Endgame. Let me just say, while it's not a perfect film, it is a perfect send-off. The film ends so perfectly that, honestly, this should be the last MCU film. I have no idea how any other MCU film will top this one. One may, who knows, but I'm being honest here. It's such a beautiful ending that completely finalizes the 11 year long run that, man, I just wouldn't mind if the MCU ended. Honestly, I say that, but I'm actually really excited for Far From Home. That's mostly because it's gonna give us what I thought was missing from Endgame, which was seeing the world after the snap. As for Endgame, Tony Stark gets a beautiful ending. The truth is, I am Iron Man. An ode to the character. Steve Rogers gets the dance he wanted, and, and Thor, well, well, Thor goes to the Guardians and is a, is a bit of a mess, I, I guess. In an interview with the New York Times, the writers of the film McFeely and Marcus talk about Tony and Steve and their respective endings. How Tony's endgame is reaching a point of selflessness, as his character has always been portrayed a bit self-centered. Meanwhile, Steve's decided to give himself the opportunity to be a little selfish, as he constantly puts others before himself. But all of them have completed arcs, and it's a great thing to watch. It's great to see all these characters say farewell, and with the end credits showcasing their signatures, it's almost like a final bow. Which it is. It's genuinely bittersweet. Again, there's a lot going on with the movie, and I'm going to talk about the character problems first, mostly, and this is going to be a bit of a ramble, so prepare yourself. The film starts off, I'm guessing, about a month after the events of Infinity War. The movie began in the best way possible. I think everyone knew how it would start from scenes from the trailer, but damn, is it great. Seeing Clint Barton lose his family in real time is fantastic because it shows the tragedy of the character and showcases the reason as to why he becomes Ronan. I would have actually liked to see more of Ronan though, as we keep hearing that Ronan's kind of lost it and is killing people left and right like a maniac. But it doesn't really look that different compared to what other Marvel heroes have done. This wouldn't bother me if Clint becoming Ronin and becoming a monster wasn't a big plot point, but it is, and you can tell that Clint is actually conflicted when he's on Vormir. It would have been better if in Tokyo, Clint was killing people that weren't actually attacking him. Unprovoked violence would make us better understand how Clint's gone off the deep end. But then again, that wouldn't be very heroic, right? Either way, we get to see Nebula and Tony hanging out in the Benatar, and I adore this entire scene. We see Tony unintentionally teaching Nebula how to be human, and teaching her compassion is something I've always kind of wanted to see from Nebula. I really wish the entire first act of the movie kept that tone, the tone of helplessness, and there's this dark comedy that's great. I think the two of them managing to have some fun and entertain themselves before their inevitable demise really plays well with the tone. And when Nebula gives Tony her portion of rations, I loved that, that little character moment. After this, Captain Marvel becomes a deus ex machina and appears to save the day, which is very cool, and I honestly would have been fine with this if the movie didn't do it twice. I was also hoping that Captain Marvel would be better in this film than in her own because she has the same amount of engagement and provides the same amount of entertainment as a piece of cardboard. But no, this doesn't happen because she's barely in it, and I really wanted to see some more Captain Marvel. And I expected it too, especially with her face being plastered all over the posters like she was a really prominent character. And even funnier, Okoye's in the poster when she has... Like, what, three minutes of screen time? Oh, no wonder she wasn't credited in the poster. And lastly, with Captain Marvel, I think like Doctor Strange, she works better with the group. Mostly because she can bounce off other characters as she is incredibly bland on her own, at least in my opinion. I really enjoy the banter everyone has when they're together. Tony and Steve haven't really forgotten about their conflict and tensions seem high. I love the VFX used to make Tony look skinny, that was fantastic. The entire scene in which the group takes down Thanos and then Thor decapitates Thanos is probably the most badass and depressing thing ever. Like the heroes can't do anything, they've lost. And as if Infinity War wasn't enough with the heroes losing at the end, Endgame begins with a loss. 
We then cut to five years later, and the world is really grim. Sadly, the first act is later undercut by random bursts of humor that I feel didn't really need to be there, and we're hit with scenes such as Professor Hulk, who was a bit more comedic than I would have liked, but that didn't bother me too much. I wish we explored this new world more. We could have cut out that entire sequence in which Ant-Man turns into a baby and an old man, and just explored more of what the world is like. We're told people are suffering and depressed, but we never really see it. And then later we see the Avengers at a diner with Professor Hulk and everyone's all cheery and stuff, and kids are running around being kids, so I wish we explored more of that. How is this world surviving? Oh God. I loved how we saw the barren streets when Ant-Man was walking around after escaping the Quantum Realm, for example. One of my absolute favorite scenes in the entire movie is Scott reuniting with his daughter, and I really felt that because if there's one thing that the Ant-Man movies do right, it's showcasing the connection Scott has with his daughter, and it showed Paul Rudd's acting chops, which is always a pleasure to see. Ant-Man is also the character that the audience is meant to connect with most, I feel, at the beginning at least. The one outsider who's seeing all these incredible things for the first time. Oh god. What's up, regular size man? <laughs> like, a viewer who hasn't really seen many Marvel movies will be instantly able to insert themselves into the movie as Scott because of that. But let's talk about the plot now. The movie starts off at such a low point, I love how everything feels really desperate, but the plot doesn't really have anywhere to go but up, which already puts the movie in a tough spot writing-wise. Going through time to recover the stones also doesn't feel as full of tension as I would have liked. It more so felt like a heroic, fun thing these heroes are doing, rather than a desperate attempt to recover what they lost. Again, this is mostly due to tonal issues and inconsistencies. For example, I feel like there were a lot of jokes for some reason. Tony specifically should not be having so much fun. He should probably be the one most worried about everything happening, especially since the time machine was something he helped design and they wouldn't even be going through time if it wasn't for his final contribution. So again, jokes like America's ass are incredibly funny, but undermine the main theme that the Avengers are desperate. When Steve, Tony, and Scott are all arguing about how they lost the Tesseract, I would have liked more of that. The only scenes in which you feel tension and desperation is Vormir in any scene in which Nebula is in, and even those kind of feel jarring because the previous scenes are rather lighthearted. Other than those few things, I love the second act. I really do think it's something fantastic to watch. It's something so complex that the writers were able to put together. I could never probably write something like that. I mean, I would love to try, but it's incredibly tough and I just, I cannot fathom that. One thing though is that the entire second act of the film feels a little bit more like a slideshow than I would have liked. It felt like a recap of the entire MCU, and what would make the second act maybe more interesting at least to me is that if they change one tiny thing in the past, the future would also change. You know, like most time travel movies. But time travel in Endgame does not work that way. Instead, changing something in the past doesn't change the present, it just creates an alternate reality. That actually reduces the few stakes that the second act already has. Also, being able to time travel back to get more pin particles also reduces the stakes yet again. Now imagine they mess up. Like for example, they did. Loki got the Tesseract, now what? It creates a ripple effect, a butterfly effect, and now they go to the present and everything is even worse. And I think that would be kind of interesting, but that obviously would be too much for a movie that's already three hours long. And this is just me spitballing, it's all subjective, I'm just trying to find ways that maybe the movie could have been improved. That doesn't mean that the movie itself did a terrible job at all. One thing I will say is that I prefer Infinity War to Endgame because Infinity War had the looming threat that was Thanos. Thanos was coming, as Bruce Banner said, and that timer the movie had was great. The characters had to get things done fast, if not they'd be screwed because Thanos would arrive. There was only so much time to get things done, and time was running out. That's why the Wakanda battle was so intense, because they couldn't let Thanos' army reach of Vision, and eventually Thanos himself does, which leads to Wanda having to pull the stone out of Vision. Stuff like that was missing from the second act of Endgame. Since there was no looming threat, but instead the looming threat was being created in the second act, to then head into the third act, then the second act of the movie should have focused on the desperation of these characters. But it played it a bit too comedically for me. Let's stop nitpicking a little bit, let's talk about the music. Now, the score by Alan Silvestri might be the best in the MCU to date, as it mixes so many musical cues from different MCU films together. And I especially loved not only hearing Ant-Man's theme by Christoph Beck, but also adding the beats into the Avengers theme when the team is concocting the time heist, as Scott calls it. Scott Lang in this movie might be the best we've ever seen him. He's competent, funny, and has his big emotional moment, so that's really great. What really makes this film work is how everything concludes. The Trinity facing off against Thanos, Steve being worthy of Mjolnir, and just the entire MCU facing off against Thanos' army. 
Can I just sidetrack real quick? I at first really wanted Bucky to become Captain America and Falcon to remain the Falcon because for me, it's always been Captain America and the Falcon, you know? And I really thought we would actually see Steve maybe debate staying in the present or going back in time and seeing Peggy, right? And on my first viewing, I was like, oh, that's so bittersweet. Steve is now old and stayed with Peggy, but I wish I saw the moment in which he decided to stay with Peggy, you know? But on second viewing, I realized that I already saw it. Steve decides to stay with Peggy once he sees her in the past. And not just that, Steve actually tells Bucky off screen that he's going to stay in the past, which is why Bucky tells Steve, I'm gonna miss you, buddy, at the end. Bucky wouldn't say that if Cap was gonna be gone for just, like, what, five seconds as planned? Don't do anything stupid until I get back. How can I? Taking all the stupid with you. So Steve must have told Bucky off screen that he was gonna stay in the past, and of course, we don't actually have to see him tell Bucky that he was gonna stay, because that would make the scene itself anticlimactic. In the same New York Times interview, McFeely says that Captain America postponed a life in order to fulfill his duty. That's why I didn't think we were ever going to kill him, because that's not the arc. The arc is, I finally get to put my shield down, because I've earned that. Now anyways, back to the finale, it was an incredible thing that I didn't expect because I actually expected the movie to end a little more quietly. There's this incredible scene of past Gamora helping future Gamora, and Gamora tells Nebula, we can do this together, we can stop him, you know, and eventually, that leads to nothing. The future Nebula just shoots down past Nebula, creating an alternate timeline instead of killing future Nebula, Looper style, which would have been maybe more interesting at least to me, and that's pretty much the last big thing they do in the entire movie. Nebula doesn't even really have a moment with Thanos after that. It's kind of underwhelming in that aspect. And that's probably my biggest gripe of the movie. I needed more Nebula. I mean, in general, I would have liked more from the main characters. I would have liked to see Bruce finally managing to gain control from the Hulk. I would have liked to see more of Black Widow. I would have liked to see more of Thor's growth. But I keep seeing everyone praise Nebula and her arc, when in actuality, her arc was already somewhat complete with Guardians Volume 2 and Infinity War. In Endgame, she's a bit of a plot point, and I would have preferred if she actually played a bigger role in stopping Thanos. But nah, Captain Marvel, baby! Captain Marvel got swatted away by Thanos, and I thought that was gonna be the beginning of a new arc for her, but I guess not. Because she kept bragging that she could kill him easily. How do we know it's gonna end any differently than it did before? Because before you didn't have me. And I feel like characters that are very prideful need to get humbled. Like Thor in the first movie, he can kick ass all day, but he finally loses and gets humbled. I am sorry. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. That hasn't happened with Captain Marvel yet, and I'm waiting for it to happen. Now, for a second, we were just talking about Thor, and I want to talk about Thor. And I think he's a good character with an interesting portrayal this time around. I watched Endgame twice, and the first time I watched it, I didn't really like Thor. But the second time, I paid more attention to certain things, and better understood what they were doing with the character. Still, I do think it was sloppily done, and I want to make a whole video on this Thor, so I'll work on that later. But I will say this, the movie explained why the character went in that direction. And I don't hate fat, sloppy, awkward Thor, it makes total sense considering this guy who's so used to winning just lost extremely hard. It's as if Thor exiting Thanos' barn at the beginning was the point in which that Thor died, and a new Thor emerged. The film should have placed a heavier emphasis on Thor going through a spiritual journey, perhaps of enlightenment and reconnection, and I wish his arc was presented in a much more concrete way. It didn't work as well as it should have, at least to me, and I know that might sound confusing, and I'll explain it better in my Thor video. Lastly, 2014 Thanos talks like 2018 Thanos, like he talks to the Avengers as if he's fought them before, which is kind of confusing. And I forgot that the Thanos that fights the Avengers in the final fight, 2014 Thanos, actually hasn't gone through what 2018 Thanos has, and that's kind of disappointing in that aspect, but it was still cool. I mean, that's just kind of nitpicky at this point. I know it may seem that I've been complaining more than praising, but that's only because everything else from the movie is absolutely fantastic. And I, I say that word a lot, fantastic. I need to find more words in my dictionary, honestly. But this movie is peak Marvel. This movie is definitely my childhood, kind of come to an end a bit. It's kind of poetic. I think this is definitely a bit of a staple in my life, as I watched the first Iron Man in theaters, and I have not missed a Marvel movie in theaters since. And I think that's kind of incredible to me, to stay with a series for so long. I mean, 
I didn't watch the Harry Potter movies, definitely, when they came out. I only started watching maybe by the fifth one. But this series I had the chance to watch from start to finish, and I definitely do not regret the ride. I'm very excited for Far From Home and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I'm not as excited for any of the other characters, or Eternals, or Shang-Chi, because pretty much I don't really know them at that point. I don't read those comic books, but of course, I hope they're good. And if they stay good, if the quality stays high, then of course I'll keep watching. Anyways guys, that's it. That's my opinion on Avengers Endgame. And lastly, I just want to say a few announcements. I want to say thank you to my patrons, you guys are amazing. There's a Discord for Browntable now, there's a subreddit for Browntable now. Browntable is growing exponentially, it's pretty freaking crazy and I love it. I love you guys so much, thank you guys for supporting me. And I'm out of school at this point, so I'm gonna try to make as much content for you guys as possible. Thanks for coming to the table, and I'll see you all next time.